there's this super simple thing that you can do to stabilize blood glucose spikes from meals. Walking. Just walking. No fancy routines or equipment required. But what's the best way to walk to get the most metabolic benefits? Before a meal? After a meal? All at once or in tiny bursts? Let's science it. Hey, welcome to Nourishable. I'm Dr. Lara. It's natural for blood glucose to rise after eating carbs, but frequent spikes and persistently high glucose levels increase inflammation, over time driving up risk of chronic diseases like type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So finding simple and sustainable habits that can suppress glucose spikes is an important factor in maintaining a healthy metabolism. Hence, my walking experiments. I've designed this N of 1 experiment to determine the most effective walking pattern to blunt my blood glucose after a carb-containing breakfast. And to take Elliot on lots of fun walks. Isn't that right, Fluff? Each day, I'll eat an identical breakfast of overnight oats, but vary when and how much I walk around this meal. I'm using a continuous glucose monitor, or CGM, paired with the Levels app for analysis. The CGM measures my glucose concentration in my interstitial fluid, basically the watery fluid surrounding my cells just under my skin, which is a good proxy for my blood glucose. To try and keep everything comparable, I'm performing all my experiments first thing in the morning after an overnight fast and eating my whole breakfast within a 15 minute window. Today is day one of my experiment, which is the no walking control. So I'm just gonna eat my overnight oats and coffee and no walking. And this is one of my personal favorite breakfasts made with old fashioned oats and chia seeds, soaked overnight in unsweetened cashew milk, Greek yogurt, and a little bit of vanilla, then served with blueberries and pistachios in the morning. It's a pretty good balance of protein, carbs, and fats with a whopping 17 grams of fiber. Yum. So now I'm just gonna sit tight for the next two hours and let my body do its thing. No, no walk this morning, Elliot. I guess a belly rub is good consolation. It's always good time for a belly rub. Here's my data in the Levels app with time along the x-axis and glucose level in milligrams per deciliter along the y-axis. I started eating my oats here. Then we see a pretty rapid rise to a peak here. Then it returns back down to baseline. The pink reflects when my glucose levels are above target, which Levels considers anything above 110. Levels also calculates a zone score, which reflects the stability of my glucose to the meal over two hours, where a higher score is a better, more stable response. So my overnight oats scored only a three out of 10, categorized as a big spike. What's going on here physiologically is my body starts to digest my consumed carbs and once they've been broken down to glucose in my intestine, they get absorbed into my blood. That causes this rise in glucose levels here. This stimulates my pancreas to release the hormone insulin. Insulin opens the doors on my muscle and fat cells to allow them to take in glucose from the blood. As my tissues take in the glucose, this causes the glucose concentration of my blood to decrease back down to baseline here. I was pretty surprised that my favorite overnight oats gave me such a big spike because the digestible carbs were paired with protein and fiber. Hmm. Room for improvement. Day two of my experiment. I'm eating my overnight oats, then immediately going for a 30 minute brisk walk. This compare zone function shows that my walk did blunt my glucose response somewhat. My no walk control is in teal and my walk in white. I started my walk here and then we see that the walk abolished my glucose rise and actually caused a slight dip until I ended my walk here when my glucose levels started to rise again. There was a slight spike but the peak was lower and later than my day one. Definitely an improvement but the oats plus an immediate post-meal walk only yielded a zone score of five. Can I modify my walking to suppress the spike even more? 
So I'm just poking around on my favorite website, PubMed, and I came across this study in the Journal of Nutrition showing that blood glucose responses were more effectively blunted if the walking was initiated 20 minutes prior to the spike. So it looks like if my spike was here around 8.30, then 20 minutes prior would be around 8.10. So that's about 15 minutes after I finished eating my meal. Well, let's give that a try. Day three of my experiment and I'm eating my overnight oats, waiting 15 minutes, then going for my 30 minute walk. Compared to my no walk control in teal, my weight and walk data in white shows super stable glucose levels with no discernible spike and a much better zone score of seven. Physiologically, the digestion and absorption of my carbs starts off the same as my control day. But as soon as I started my walk here, we see that the developing spike just stopped. And that's because as I'm walking, my muscles are taking in glucose from the blood to fuel their contractions. And they're doing this independent of insulin. Remember that insulin is the hormone that stimulates the insertion of glucose doorways into cells so that glucose can enter from the blood. But it turns out that muscle contractions can also stimulate insertion of these glucose doorways, even in the absence of insulin. Since my walk occurred when my body was rapidly absorbing glucose from my digested oats, my muscles took in the glucose immediately such that my blood levels were blunted. Well, I'm impressed, especially because this wasn't super strenuous physical activity, just a nice brisk walk with my fluffy love. Realistically, it's not always possible to squeeze in a 30 minute walk after every meal. Is a shorter jaunt just as effective? On day four of my experiment, I ate my oats, waited 15 minutes, then walked 15 minutes. Oh, time to turn around. It's a short one today, Fluff. Compared to the no walk control in teal, the short walk in white still spiked just as high, then rapidly dipped before bouncing back, overall yielding a worse zone score of two. Well, for me, it seems that this shorter walk doesn't cut it for blunting my blood glucose. Ever since welcoming a dog into the family, I've been a first thing in the morning walker. Is a pre-meal walk just as effective as a post-meal walk? Day five of my experiment, and I took Elliot for a 30 minute sunrise walk, then immediately ate my oats. My glucose response with the pre-meal walk in white has a pretty identical rise and spike to the no walk control in teal though I do return to baseline faster, yielding a slightly better zone score of four. Although my muscles may have been slightly primed to take in glucose after my walk, this effect wasn't substantial enough to suppress the spike after digesting my carbs. In the past few years, there's been a shift in the physical activity field to not just increase movement, but also reduce periods of sedentary time. Studies have shown an association between longer uninterrupted sitting and worse markers of cardiometabolic health, like inflammation, insulin sensitivity, and waist circumference. Other studies have found breaking up sedentary time with cycles of short walking bouts significantly dampens the glucose response to meals. Well, let's try that too. I modeled my experiments after a few different studies. One day I ate my oats, then cycled between two minutes of walking with 20 minutes of sitting for the full two hours after my meal. The next day I ate my oats, then cycled between five minutes of walking and 30 minutes of sitting. Compared to the no walk control in teal, neither of the walk sit cycles really impacted my glucose response that much. They both brought down my glucose levels up to baseline a bit faster, but the spikes were just as fast and high as not walking at all. I'm frankly a little sad that this cycling wasn't very effective. When we put all the data together into a colorful jumble, there's a clear winner in yellow. 
waiting 15 minutes after my meal, then going for a brisk 30 minute walk was the only combo to substantially suppress my glucose spike compared to the no walk control in teal. I think the reason this wait then walk method was so effective was because my walking period exactly matched up with what would have otherwise been my glucose spike. While I was walking, my contracting muscles were able to take in glucose from the blood as it was absorbed from my intestines. This probably gave insulin time to circulate and allow other tissues to take up glucose too, overall maintaining super stable glucose levels. Now, this was a pretty well-controlled study that may not totally reflect real life. I may have gotten different results with a different type of breakfast, or if I walked at a different pace. Plus, my results may not necessarily reflect what would happen for you because we may differ by age, sex, or insulin sensitivity. But overall, between my experiments and studies in the literature, the take home message seems to be that initiating light physical activity roughly 30 minutes after starting a meal is an effective tool for blunting blood glucose spikes. After running this experiment, I've completely shifted my morning routine to eat breakfast first, bop around in the kitchen a bit doing the dishes, then take Elliot for his brisk morning walk. I've also tried to incorporate this info into other habits too, like intentionally parking far away from restaurants so that I can have a post-meal walk, or scheduling walking meetings after lunch. The things I love about these results are that walking is free and generally a pretty accessible form of physical activity. Plus, it can be pretty fun to break up the day with some outdoor time. That bonus also boosts your metabolic health. That's what science tastes like. Thanks to Levels for sponsoring this video so I could totally nerd out on data. If you want to try out Levels and run your own N of 1 experiments to learn how your body uniquely responds to food and exercise, follow my link in the video description and let me know if your findings are similar to mine. And if you want to help support Nourishable in making more evidence-based nutrition science content, please support me on Patreon. Link in the video description along with all my references cited in this episode. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all things nutrition.